When your voice can connect with the words that reside in your gut, and the words have to travel through your heart, let them meet here, because this is where lies the truth. And don't worry if the brain is bypassed in this lower path just because it's too high. We don't need brains. We have too much of it everywhere. It's there in my school, it's there in your job, it's there in science, it's there in politics, it's there in war, it's there in peace, it's there in Democrats. I'm not sure about Republicans, though. <laughs> we don't need brains. We have too much of it everywhere. Let your voice and words take this lower path, path that connects here, because this is where lies the truth. This path may not be able to change the world. This path may not be able to create inventions. But who wants to change the world? I just want to change the way we see this world. The theme for today is 3D, and I wasn't really sure how I would fit into this 3D theme, because I am a PhD student, and generally, PhD students have a very hard time to fit anywhere. <laughs> they don't really have a second dimension to them, let alone the third. Our day starts with an experiment that usually fails and ends with the data that we ourselves don't know what to make out of it. And if one fine day some experiment work, then we keep wondering, what did I do wrong? Why did it work? Because, of course, now the bigger challenge is to be able to repeat it. And the reason it takes several years to do a PhD is because we keep on discovering novel and innovative ways of making the same mistake. <laughs> and whenever I meet people at coffee shops, they don't ask me, how are you? They will always ask me, have you found the cure for cancer? Do you think you'll be able to treat the disease? And that just adds to my guilt feeling. And I go back to my list of failed experiments. Brene Brown, in her TED Talk, mentioned that TED is a failure conference. And I thought, yes, I should grab this opportunity and rant all about my failed experiments. Finally, I found the audience. <laughs> But before I talk about my research, I want to talk about my past, because it has a very important role to play in my current research, or the idea behind the research. My mother got married at the age of 15, had me by the age of 17, and was a widow by the age of 20 comes from a society where they cry at the birth of a female child, comes from a society where being a widow is considered as curse, comes from a society where the concept of educating women doesn't really exist. And she finished her education while raising three girls when everyone in the neighborhood will have pity on her for having three girls and no boy and no husband. And I also had a grandmother, and generally, grandmoms make very good motivational speakers. <laughs> and my grandmother was of the opinion that if I ever go to school, I'll be ineligible for marriage. No one will ever marry me. But I think she was right. I'm still single. <laughs> and when I went to school, I was sent back from school for not being able to pay the fees. And I'll pack my bags and go back to school again, only to be sent back. I guess children at that age do not suffer from embarrassment. They only suffer from ADHD. Some diseases are age-specific. So I am the product of that idea where a bunch of people decided to send students like me back to school and support their education financially, irrespective of the result, irrespective of their success or failure. Everyone can support intelligent students. 
but I was a teacher's nightmare. I had red marks all over my report card. And whenever I struggled at school, my mom would tell me, that someone out there has not lost faith in you yet. Then how can you? But then my mom tells me all sorts of stuff. She also told me that hope is precious, don't lose it. And I thought I can go to school and tell them that I have hope, which is precious. Can you please let me in? But I think she was right. From struggling every single day at school to becoming university's gold medal, winning university's gold medal, from not knowing how to speak to being able to come and stand here, from being sent back from school to winning national scholarships, from not having water at home. I marveled every time when not only there was water in the tap, it was also hot and cold. <laughs> from not having electricity at home, I marveled every time when not only there is electricity, it's been 24 hours and the electricity is still there. So I'm the product of that idea known as Aim for Seva, All India Movement for Seva, where students like me got financed for their education, even though I was not a very good student at that time, by the way. <laughs> and then I came to Canada from India to pursue my PhD in anti-cancer drug discovery project. And as you can make out, it was a very smooth process from plus 35 degrees Celsius to minus 35 degrees Celsius. Not sure if that was a good idea. And my supervisor had this similar concept about the drug discovery project. His idea was to recycle the existing, not so successful anti-cancer drugs by redesigning them and modifying them in such a way as to improve upon their anti-cancer activity. And because we already know the properties of these drugs, it can be a very time and cost effective strategy. So the idea was to redesign the existing not so successful anti-cancer drugs in a way as to improve upon their anti-cancer activity. And so the project was started, and the medicinal chemist designed several drugs, and I started working on those drugs, and as you can make out, my first project was a total disaster. Absolutely no data. Let's not even go there. And I don't know how many PhD students you know very closely, but there are a few of them out there who think that with every failed project, their world has come to an end. And I'm one of them. <laughs> but when everything outside you tells you that this is the end, that's because it's true. It is the end, end of everything that's holding you back. And I restarted the project, and this time I worked on a different drug named We Are, designed and named after the person who designed it, the medicinal chemist who designed it. And this drug was designed from an anti-malarial drug known as chloroquine. Chloroquine is a very famous anti-malarial drug and was used in World War II against malaria. And how this drug works is, our cells in the body have a recycling system. Cells use this recycling system known as autophagy as a mechanism, as a source of energy to balance the sources of energy. So during the time of crisis, during cellular stress, or during starvation, cell recycles its organelles as a source of energy. However, if it keeps on going too much, then cell can die too. Cell also have another mechanism known as proteasome system. Proteasomes are protein degradation factories inside the cell. They degrade the damaged and misfolded proteins in the cell and they also maintain the optimal level of proteins required to carry out specific cellular functions. And recent research has shown that cancer cells, unlike normal cells, have very high proteasome activity to support their continuous proliferation. 
And this recycling system works pretty much like our recycling system. The product to be processed is packaged and sent to lysosomes in the case of autophagy, where they get degraded and processed, or they're sent to proteasomes if they're proteins, where they get degraded and processed and reused. Chloroquine inhibits autophagy. However, we found that the, no the novel derivative of chloroquine, we are, inhibits proteasomes far more efficiently. And this has also improved its anti-cancer activity and its tolerability in animal models. And I presented this work at AACR Cancer Conference, one of the biggest cancer conferences. And I presented my research work there. And some people said that, isn't it that chloroquine inhibits autophagy? I said, yeah, chloroquine inhibits autophagy. But now the derivative is inhibiting proteasomes far more efficiently. And they said, no. You should study autophagy, because that's what chloroquine does. And I said, A, if I keep doing what others have already done, I may not get my PhD. I hope you understand my concern here. And B, the reason I'm showing this mechanism is simply because this is how the drug works. And this slide shows that how after the four weeks of treatment after this drug, the tumor is completely gone as compared to the non-treated samples in the upper panel. And I'm not saying that this will be the next blockbuster drug, no. It may succeed or it may not succeed in clinics. We don't know yet. A lot of work is in progress. But if I'm not allowed to fail, how else I can do research then? And the fact is that the world doesn't start with you or ends at you. The world starts with the sun and it ends at the stars. And between these two, there's plenty of space to move, to stop, to fail, to succeed, to fall, to get up. That's what all this space is for. And I would like to thank you all for giving all this space to experiment by donating your dollar and your confidence to local research efforts. This drug discovery project has also laid the foundation for a startup pharmaceutical here. And the focus is to recycle the drugs that are redesigned in the lab, not only for their anti-cancer activity, but also for infectious diseases. Because in the process of redesigning, the chemist may have improved upon their antibacterial or antiviral properties too. So that work is still in progress. And lastly, when I first came to Canada from India, my mother's only concern was not my PhD. Her only concern was that I should not drink alcohol, I should not eat meat, I should not go for late night parties. And everyone in my hometown prays to the holy river Ganga. My mother will pray to the river every day for my well-being. And when I was coming here, I said, Mom, there is no river Ganga there. Now who is going to take care of me? And she gave me the water from the river and asked me to put into the lake here to initiate the connection between the two lakes, between the two water bodies. This is her networking. <laughs> This is how she networks. And I said, Mom, the lake remained frozen for 10 months out of 12. Now what? <laughs> so I would like to finish with a poem that I wrote during one of those failed experiment nights. You were the only one who knew that I am hurt again. Even though I put a brave front, a cool front, as if nothing happened. But only you know that it did happen. No one will see that vulnerable side of me, because I'm cool. 
but you know it. Because you live in that warmth beneath my coolness. Because only you can feel that stiffness whenever I shrug off. Because only you can hear the silence in between my smiles. Because only you can see the moisture through my sparkly eyes. Because you live in all those secret wishes that I always hide in the dark night, and when I was staring at that night, he took my finger and showed me the moon. Probably that's why I still see your face whenever I see that moon. Mom, you and only you are my valentine. Thank you.